Well, I know we're starting a bit late. Um, we're trying to get some stuff loaded up that we won't be able to use, so we're going to do it a little differently now. We're going to do it manually, eye to eye, person to person. I'm Terrence Howard, and I'm so honored to have been invited here to speak at Oxford. Um, Chris is so magnificent. He's been the kindest person, and he's really an angel for you guys because he can bring a ton of people here just with his kind words. Um, how many of you are interested in acting? None. Great. <laughs> Maybe a couple of y'all. So, you know, I didn't have any training as an actor, right? No? You know, um, I grew up in a real bad part of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, wore little girls' dresses for the first two years of my life because we didn't have any money for, for clothes for me. Um, I managed to climb my way out of there by doing a fancy little thing called lying. You know? You guys do any of that? <laughs> um, back in 1986, when I started working in this business, there was no thing called the internet. So when I put my first um, resume together, since I was trying to go and get jobs, I'd go and knock at doors and, and go and do castings, and nobody would take me seriously because I didn't have an agent and I didn't have a resume. So I put together a three-page resume of all the projects that I wanted to do. And I was going to, and I put my name on them, starring in all these things, and that was my first resume and it got me into the door and as time went on over the last 35 years i filled up that thing so it's no more lies on my resume it's all truth but it wasn't lies then it was what i was going to ha what i was going to make happen and that's what i want to say most of what you are trying to accomplish today or tomorrow is the same thing you were trying to accomplish 20 years ago you're the same person that you were then if you lose that little spark that kept you motivated, that little piece, like this is my vocation. I'm a, I love acting half the time, but there's some downfalls of it. You know, a lot of actors end up with um, personality, identity crisis and conflicts because you have so many characters you're playing. And if you really commit to the characters, you become like a piece of clothing and your body becomes what they put on. And the character has a tendency of wanting to own you. They don't let go. What you saw in Anthony Hopkins and Hannibal Lecter, that monster lives in him. That's why we believed it. it. He had to tap into something very ugly in our human nature sometimes. And as an actor, sometimes I tap into beautiful things. But like with Lucius, and the character I play with Lucius, his life is, is filled with turmoil. So 90% of the day, I'm walking around carrying his turmoil and also the turmoil for me and my own family. And then you have to, you, how do you have time to really bring yourself back to who you are? Because that's the most important thing. That's the thing that's, that's going to bother you more than anything else. You will look at yourself one day and you won't know who you are because you don't remember who you were. You know, at some time along the way, or maybe at 13 or 14, we let go of the little person that kept us going. That little person that was always there, I got you, man. I'm here, I got you, don't know. You don't go in there, I ain't going in there. That person, when we get about 13 or 14, we get embarrassed of him. And we push him aside and we don't listen to him anymore. And he's always knocking. Hey, hey. And after so long of a time, maybe 10, 15 years, you don't even know him. You show up at your own door and you don't even know who you are. Your family doesn't know who you are. So it's important no matter what you do, no matter what challenges you go through, you remember who you are. You may think you've been here for 20 years on this planet, but we know that energy, it is forever. It doesn't die. It continually recycles itself. So you know that you've been a trilobite, 350 million years ago, or some part of it, some parts of you were part of a, a pterodactyl. Every one of us have been a part of everything in this universe, so if we tap into those things in ourselves and remember those things in ourselves, we have that power. Now, my vocation has been an actor, and I've loved that. I've been able to take care of my family as an actor, but that's never been my passion. 
I was an actor because it was like Jesus walking on water for tips, because he could do it. That's what he did. It was a natural thing for him. I've always been an empath. I've always been emotionally connected to everything. But the thing that I was most spiritually connected to, that was my driving force, was physics. It was wondering how the universe really came to be. And I fell in love with this thing called the flower of life. You guys know da Vinci. Do you know what he spent most of his life trying to figure out? Who in here knows the flower of life? Couple? I'm going to get you something. Because I want you guys to know. Should we hold it? Huh? Should we hold it? Okay. No, no, I'm going to hold it up. I want you guys to know about a 6,000 year old secret. 6,000 years, mankind has been trying to decipher this one little thing called the flower of life. Now do you know the flower of life? Have you guys ever seen this before? Now you know this is one of the oldest symbols in um, human history, right? Or do you not know? This symbol was found in the Temple of Osiris in Egypt, and it had been molecularly burned into the wall. And it's 6,000 years old. This, this same symbol has been found in the, the forbidden temples in China, sitting under the fufu dogs. And the foot on it, the flower of life, saying whoever controlled that flower of life controlled the universe. There were secrets in that flower of life that da Vinci spent his whole life trying to uncover. There were secrets in that flower of life that Newton spent his whole life in secret trying to uncover. The same secrets that Pythagoras was desperately trying to uncover. But their problem was they kept seeing this in a two-dimensional space. They couldn't get it out of this two-dimensional frame. And as a result, they got stuck in this plane, a flat plane. Now, what da Vinci and all of them wanted to do, they were trying to find a way to bring this flower to life because what is inside of it? Well, apparently, there were secrets inside of it. Shapes, they got the Macurba and all of those other things out of it. But they were misled by something I think called a straight line. You guys believe in straight lines? You believe there's straight lines in the universe? Well, let me hit you with something. All energy in the universe is expressed in what? It's in motion. If something is still, there's no energy. Kinetic, right? All motion is expressed in what? You look at galaxies. Are they expressed in straight lines? Expressed in vortices. All vortices are expressed in what? Waves. All waves are curved. Show me a straight line in nature. You show me where the platonic solids come from. Where do they have their foundations in our universe? Are there any straight lines? If you look at anything, there are no straight lines. That's been the mistake. We've been looking at these straight lines, this Euclidean way of thinking, and missing the curvature of nature. So here we are, back with the curvature of nature. And you have all these little pieces. Now, this has always been an information system. So compa compare some of these points, take a point here, and say, well, what's the space in between all of these things? Now, they've said that all the in-between spaces, if this is the Earth and this is the moon right here, all this in-between space is filled with what? A void. There's nothing in the void. Well, I found that there is something in the void. The elementary fundamental particles that they've been searching for at the CERN Collider, the Hedron Collider and CERN, I found that their energy signatures matched perfectly to some of the pieces that I was able to pull out of here. So I'm going to bring some of those now. Do I have a minute? Am I good? OK. Now, all of this was supposed to be on a projector for you guys. I don't have that. So what I do have is a bit of a Chanel bag, or an old Chanel bag, a box, as it were. And we're going to talk about a couple of items in here that are so hard to even express here. Afterwards, you're going to have to just take a look at these. My God, I won't have the time to do it. I couldn't show you. But 
I am going to show you. <laughs> I didn't come here not to show you. Now, whether you guys are able to express, understand some of these things, Lord help me, get confused. What I've done is I've figured out about 70 different, seven different elementary particles, fundamental particles. And then there were secondary generational particles that seemed to occur. And when these things began to build up more and more, they began to create their own systems. And these systems is what I've brought to Oxford because I would like for you guys to examine them, put them to test because I bet you, you will find all the fundamental particles that they've been looking for in the unified theory of the universe. It's a big statement, but I've got a lot of stuff to back it up if I'm given the opportunity to do so. But the flower of life has been opened, and when we get an opportunity, I'd love to show you some of these things. Can I go on? Yep, you're good. Mm -hmm. I can't, without, having to, without being able to show the pieces, it's a whole different monster. But all of these wave conjugations, all of these states of matter, all of these things, there's time, it's time for that to be changed now. We have changed all of our, our buildings to be aerodynamic, our airplanes are no longer based on a two-dimensional Euclidean way of life, but our math is still based on a two-dimensional way. And I think in order for us to reach the future, we have to examine that. Do you guys know about um, loops in math? Do you believe in loops? Do you know the square root of two? Do you think that's a loop? Do you believe that the square root of two is the square root of two? Yes or no? Hands up, no? Hello? Oh, I want y'all to take out your phone for a minute then. We're gonna do one thing. Everybody got a phone? Put it on their calculator and turn it to the side so you can get all the long numbers out of it. Okay? Now I want you to put in two and square root it. Two, hit the square root. You'll get 1.414213562373095 dot, 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 right? Now I want you guys to do me a favor, cube it. It'll see right over there, it'll be x to the three. Can y'all do it? Are you cubed it? It'll see 2.828427121746190. Now that makes sense. I want you guys to do me a favor. Divide it by two. Get that number. Cube it again. Divide it by two. Cube it again. And I want you to do that until the end of your lives. <laughs> and that number will still come up with 2.828-4271-2174-6190. Any other number that you, above two, that you put in and you cube and you square, cube and square and divide by two, by the sixth operation, it has moved into an exponential number that you can't even imagine. Any number below two that you do that same operation with, it will go into an exponentially small matter and number. This is what we call a loop. It is illogical, it doesn't make sense, and it does not make math make sense. So these are some things that, that um, I'm bringing to the fore and that I would like to question. I would like to audit the math, the world of mathematics, and I would like to audit how we view the platonic solids because I think the new wave conjugations will tell a better story of how our world works. And that's it. It wasn't quite what I thought for, Chris. Yeah, well, but I wanted my pictures. You guys got it. And y'all won't even have time afterwards. But um, I've spent 45 years searching these things out and trying to figure out what the universe really, how it really worked. And we've come to find that the universe, they are abandoning the standard model, the ideas of black holes and dark matter for an electric model of the universe that is in response to the Birkeland currents and all these things. It's a better version, a better vision of how we should see the universe. That's how, that's how I see it and I think it should be explored.
So just to add some context to this, uh, Terence and I have spent the afternoon together and Terence has showed, showed me a lot of this and, and, and explained to, to my feeble mind uh, uh, basically what he's theorizing. I thought uh, the, the, the couple of things that you showed me that I thought were, were really good were how um, you uh, exp explaining the story about how originally the, uh, the, the flower of life um, everybody just followed the lines and didn't understand the space. And you had the quite good models in there yes. of how they connect together and how you have managed to put it into a 3D shape rather than just people looking at 2D. 2D uh, perhaps you want to explain a little bit about that. Yeah, the idea of, like one of the things I've been saying, the Euclidean mindset has kept us so locked away. Like there's tons of paperwork of da Vinci working on the flower of life and trying to unravel it. But every single existence, every single example, you see him making straight lines and trying to make these straight lines bend in, and therefore he was never able to open it up because all the universe is curved, all space is curved. And as a result, what I was doing in trying to find these straight lines, I abandoned the idea of the straight line. The shortest distance between two points is curved space because you cannot force your way straight through space, even electricity, as it moves from the, a southern plane to a northern plane, it always goes northeast in its direction. And, and magnetism, as it expands out, it goes southwesterly. And that's the spin. That's how you always know whether it's magnetism or electricity. It's the spin. Is it northeast or is it southwest? But in trying to define curved matter, I'm so sorry, I get so distracted trying to define the spaces, it allowed me to see that all of these in between, what we have been dealing with is these petals. All of man, mankind have dealt with these petals, but is these other shapes that we've ignored constantly. Well, those other shapes were the in-between spaces. They were the things that filled up the vacuum of space. And all these particles that I have, um, I think, are the full proof of that. And it is also the full proof of the wave particle argument. Yeah. Do you, do you want to also explain a little bit about why, what your intention was in sort of bringing this up? And sort of what, because something you said was yep. the next step is like, what, how do you apply this? Well, here we are on this planet. Is, can I do that point? The, our planet is moving away from our sun at six inches a year. You guys know that, 15 centimeters a year, our planet is pushing away from the sun. So in less than uh, half a billion years, our planet will be out of the Goldilocks zone, will be somewhere near where Mars is, somewhere halfway between there. So life will not be able to sus be sustained on this planet anymore. So if we're going to be able to, uh, to sustain ourselves as a species, we have to become interstellar not just interplanetary, you have to become interstellar. But with approximations, you cannot become interstellar. You cannot become interstellar with a, a point that will take you all the way over here with a straight line when the actual event is taking place over here, when you're going 600 quadrillion miles, you can't make a mistake, you need precision. And that's what the math is about. These pieces predict the natural distri distribution of matter and the distribution of where you can find yourself in that space, and I'm confident behind it. For 40 years I've worked on this, and um, I think it's ready. So I, I've sat also at lunch, basically trying to get round, my head around this, and also uh, I was very, very, very skeptical, uh, and I put my hands up and say that. And one of the things that you mentioned was sort of like how this applies to, I think it was the electric sun model, uh, and that's where um, it's it's a, a theory that suggests that the sun is powered from external forces rather than what nuclear is usually power. rather than nuclear fusion, which is the general consensus among scientists. Um, and the reason for that is because there's not a production of, of uh, there's no evidence to suggest that the byproduct neutral, uh, neutrinos Jeez. um are, are, are there. And the what, you need, what, of... what what Terence is is trying to prove, I think, is that. Because, that, because the fact that you can't detect whether the neutrinos are there or not, um, there must be another, another way in which, which they're powered. 
My argument to him is that for, to suggest that neutrinos don't exist, because we have a lot of evidence to, to not know that they're physically there, but a lot of the effects and how they interplay with other things, mm -hmm. to suggest that they don't exist is, is, um, to, is not only to, to get rid of that small theory, but also quite a lot of other huge uh, laws of, of physics. Are that, they laws or are they ideas of physics? Well, why don't, okay, why don't you respond to that and talk about how a lot of people have that sort of narrow mindset. And sort of, you talked yeah, about identity. Yeah, the, the identity element. The, the things that make our math works. Like if I said to you, what's one times one? What'd you say, one? It equals one? Now, what, what would Newton say is that? Action times an action. That's a reaction, right? Anybody in here that thinks one times one equals one, then you give me two pounds and I'll give you a pound back. And we'll call that even, right? Because one times one equals one. An unbalanced equation. What we need to do is, the first thing in math is you're supposed to have a balanced equation. One times one equaling one is an unbalanced equation. But the identity element, which is like the Jim Crow laws of the 60s, they say that anything multiplied by one becomes that same number as itself. Well, the laws of physics has to break down in order for that to take place, action and reaction, for one times one to equal one. In comparison to if I said, um, what's a dollar times a dollar? Anybody know it's a dollar? Well, what's, what's, what's a dime times a dime or 10 pence? 10 pence, yeah. 10 pence times 10 pence? That's, that's a pound? Right? 10 pence times 10 pence? Is that right, honey? Yeah. Yes. What about 100 pence times 100 pence? That's a dollar times, a pound times a pound, right? That's $100, ain't it? What about a quarter? What about four quarters times four quarters? That's a dollar, right? That's a pound, right? Well, that's $4. Now, all of these things are legal. The banks can say a dollar times a dollar is a dollar and give you that. Or the banks can say to a friend, a dollar times a dollar is a quarter times a quarter. It's four quarters times four quarters, and give that person four dollars. They can say to another person, a dollar times a dollar is um, 100 pence times 100 pence. That person gets 100 dollars, so that money is generated. And this is all legal. Do you think it's not happening in the banks? This is what one times one equaling one has got us. This inconsistency of our monies and our economy is sitting in the balance, and the rest of our future is sitting in the balance because our science has been stunted as a result of the problems in mathematics because math asks for the basic laws of physics to break down in order for one times one to equal one. In order for one times zero to equal nothing, laws of conservation of energy has to disappear. And math is, the foundating laws of math is support the, supposed to support the laws of physics. They are arm in arm. They cannot be in controversy with each other. So we need an audit on the platonic solids. We need an audit on the square root of two. And we need an audit on action and reaction. Or we either got to get rid of, we say one times one equals one, and there's no action and reaction. One or the other. You can't have both. And until we make that change, we're in trouble. We're going to be stunted as a, as a species. Great. Should we open up to questions from no, the audience? No, I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> Come on. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand uh, nice and high. Uh, you can ask about the, the physics or the acting. Uh, Terence is yeah. how, how, how to Yeah, let's start with He's you. a lawyer physicist. I'm an actor physicist. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I just had a question about um, kind of acting and uh, physics as well. Just like I know that you said that physics was your, your drive and like how you are doing acting and I just want to know like how you got academically like interested in physics itself because I kind of feel like they're a little bit different but I think that the, the bridge that you have between them are really cool. No, they're all, the, well everything is based on chemical reactions. In order for me to become a character, I have to change my chemical composition of how I'm thinking and as a result that changed how I position myself, which changes how the heat is generated and transferred out and in and out of my body. Everything is, comes down to chemistry, you know. So acting in physics, in, in physics, if when two things are drawn to each other, it's because they are of similar charge. It's not positive because when you, they say negatives attract, but cold air drops down. Does it attract to the hot air rising up? 
No, it passes right by each other because negatives, opposites don't attract, it's positives that attract to each other. Two positives drawn to each other, two negatives discharge each other. So it's all about physics to me, it's all about chemistry and it's how the physics, how, we, how another actor is relating to me, a slight change in his body language changes my tone. It's all physics. Okay, yeah, anyone? Yeah, let's go to you. Uh, hey, Terrence. My name is uh, Carrick, and I'm originally from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and so earlier you mentioned about acting, um, and I just had a question about the entertainment industry. Uh, being that I'm from Atlanta, everyone swears they're a rapper or that they can rap. Uh, even my grandma said she was dropping a gospel mixtape. Um, so that's dropping this spring, apparently. Um, and so I have an older brother who actually wants to get into the music industry. Um, and it got me thinking about hustle and flow. Um, it probably wasn't as gritty as hustle and flow was, uh, but he's really trying to get his name out there. Um, and so my question to you is, what advice would you have for someone who's trying to break into the entertainment industry, whether it be acting or music? Uh, also, I got a copy of his songs on here if you want to listen to it on the way back home. Well, you just <laughs> said it right. You said break into the business. How do you break into something? Oh, we'll enter the business if that. No, 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 you had it right. Because they don't want you in there. Everybody else wants that job. They're trying to keep you out. So you have to break into the business. How do you break into something? It's a little cunning involved in that. And there's a little violence involved in that. It's aggression involved in breaking into something. So there's passion involved in that. And that passion is what's going to drive you. Wherever you're supposed to be, I can tell you, oh, go over to, you know, to Fifth and Dunbar, and it's going to happen for you over there. It's not going to happen there. It's going to happen for you when you actively work in concert with your desires. So you want to be an actor? You don't go to Saudi Arabia. You got to go to L.A. or or, or New York in, in the states, and you you do your time there. And my thing is, I have no toleration for rivalry, whatsoever. It's, it's not black eyes and bloody noses for me, it's life or death when I'm in that ring. And that ring is the set and the stage for me. So I'm coming in there to dismantle you. I'm coming in there to take away any falsehood that you have, that you were carrying yourself with. I want to shake that up with truth and to where you don't even know your lines afterwards that you're just sitting there. So if you can't come in ready for life or death, you think it's a black eye, a bloody nose, you will lose your life in that game. You go in there and you destroy them and you break into the business however you have to. Great. Yeah, let's go to, to you in the glasses. Yeah, you. Yeah, you stand up. Uh, so, so my, my question is when you go to um, play parts or uh, like decide to. Uh, decide on what exactly you want to play in a movie or a series. Do you look for specific things in uh, a character that you're going to portray, or do you just immerse yourself into the character and uh, see how it goes from there? Yeah, I don't do all that little tricky stuff about, oh, I'm going to go and this character reads this or any of that stuff. You know, me, I'm just, I sit there and I try and look for what resonate, resonates, what resonates with, with, the, with the character. Ooh, that, you suck. I hate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll get the other one. <laughs> it's, if the truth is in the character, if the character is written well, you don't have to do anything. All you do is have to sit there and say the words. And somehow in the words, it's going, it, just little bells like playing Candy Crush, little things just pop up out of nowhere, and you're just doing it, and you, you get lost in it. If you allow yourself, it's just a river, man. You know, get naked and ride in it and jump out when you get cold. But don't be afraid of the rapids, don't be afraid of the rocks. You know, you just, you know, jump out of an airplane and say, to hell with it, you know? Great, thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go to you and the red jumper. Thank you for coming. I wanted to ask a question. You seem to like, um, be sitting on a wealth of knowledge and something you've been working on for, how you put it, 40 years. I was gonna ask, how are you 
living day-to-day life knowing that the rest of the world is doing it, quote-unquote, incorrectly? Um, well, it's been 40 years of me dancing on this thing. For 40 years, I was told I was wrong. For 40 years, I was told that, you know, the platonic solids and all those were the solids. You know, um, you have to have faith in self. You know, all of this, I can sit up here and tell you guys that, you know what, I'm the smartest man in the world. I figured out what Da Vinci and none of them could do. The truth is, you really want to know the truth? This may be crazier than, than the fiction. The truth is, I, wo- I woke up inside my mother's womb at about six months of age. I woke up inside of there, like boom. I don't know what had happened. Maybe my mother went through some trauma or whatever, but I woke up and I was like, oh God, I'm here. I'm here, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Don't forget. This is truth. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. This go by, every once in a while I would think, I would think about something and this would come over. And I thought, I didn't know it was my hand. I thought it was a friend. I had my whole name for it. Inside that womb, you were conscious. You woke up, because with, with our son, our son Kieran, when he was about, my wife was six months pregnant, we would put the light on her stomach and he would follow it and push on it. And then we'd put the music and we'd put it all the way over to the other side and he would crawl all the way over to the other side of the stomach and push at the light with the music. So what I'm saying to you, you are conscious inside the womb, but we have no common frame of reference. But I remember, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, because I knew I'd been here. Don't forget, you know what I didn't want to forget? This flower of life. Because apparently I been interested in it at a given time. And I came out and I was born, the first thing I thought about when I was five years old, I was, I was obsessed with bubbles. I was like, why does a bubble take the shape of a ball? Why not a square or a triangle? And I would go and try and make square or triangle of bubbles. And we could never do it because it turns out everything expands as a sphere and everything contracts in geometric form. You drop a pebble into the pond, it expands in a perfect sphere unless there's something in the way. The moment it hits the edge of the shore and starts to come back, it's the contracting waves that hit the expanding waves that creates the initial geometries. Everything expands as a sphere, everything contracts in geometry and fits, basically. So um, what I'm saying, And what I tried to tell you guys earlier, this is not your first time, it's not your first rodeo, and it won't be your last rodeo. Don't panic in this life. You can actually, there's no sense of death. Everything goes to sleep and it wakes back up again. Refolds and unfolds, refolds and unfolds. And if you're you're wise, if you're careful, because you can remember conscious moments in your life, can't you? You can remember moments when you're like, wait a minute, I'm in a bigger space than just this little body right here. You become fully aware of everything around you. And if you quiet yourself, you can think about those things. Well, apparently I did that at the last passage because when I came into this life, I woke up, remember, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. And the first thing I did was worked out the flower of life. When I was six years old, I started making these pieces. What Da Vinci tried to do at 80, I did at six years old because I had been working on it perhaps from a past life. Now I'm not trying to say I'm crazy or there's reincarnation or anything, but we know that energy does not die. Energy just reboots itself and reboots itself. So we are eternal. So stop panicking, thinking your life is over. You've done this trillions of times. You'll get good at it and we'll be perfect one time if we get conscious, but we have to get conscious. Because I can either say I'm the smartest man in the world that I figured out what nobody else in the world could figure out. With Aristotle, with, with Plato, Pythagoras, all of them tried to figure this out, but I know I am not smarter than these men. So I know that there's something to the consciousness of carrying things through, because the information and the knowledge that I have, I didn't go to school. I had a 1.6 grade point average graduating from high school because I had other things to do. But this information kind of educated me along the way because I was born into it. And now I have the pieces to follow it and hopefully Chris and um, maybe Oxford and some of the, will do some of the vetting for these things and we can change the world. 
But if not, I'll keep doing it and I'll do it in the next lifetime. If not this one, and the next lifetime after that. Just remember, and another thing don't forget, you know you go from positive to negative, everything polarizes positive to negative, then more than likely with each lifetime, male to female, male to female, if the universe is consistent. I think it is. Great. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go to you. Uh, thank you very much for talking to us and also your view on consciousness and energy sounds very similar to what Dr. Robert Lanza proposes in Biocentrism, um, so that may be of interest to you if you haven't read that text. But uh, about five years ago you spoke about harmonic wave sequencing and how that could Harmonic wave resequencing. Resequencing and how that could possibly solve cancer or genetic ailments within the next five years. I think that was about five years ago. So is there much progress on that? And how do you propose that this resequencing would actually recode people's genetics in order to prevent them from getting Simple. these elements? Simple, our DNA is made up of what? Five elements, right? Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and oxygen. Do you know how they're arranged? The phosphorus sits right here in the middle and you've got four oxygen atoms surrounding it. Then there's another phosphorus, two more oxygen atoms. Now these are the legs of that double helix. These are the legs. Now the, the ladder steps on it, they become the adenine, the guanine, the cytonine, and thymine, the ATCGs. It turns out hydrogen, they used to think that energy, the, the body transferred or understood the energy information through electricity. They're finding out it's through frequency. Well, guess what hydrogen sounds like? It's a key of E. Guess what, um, and it's the color yellow. That's what proper physics gets you to. Hyd oxygen is a chartreuse, and it's the key of F over F sharp. Now, they used to, like I said, information used to be thought about as just electrical information passing on. But I've got a question for you. Have you ever been at a party with some of your friends you ain't seen in 10 years, but y'all was like 14, you hung out and there's a song that came on and you like, ah, and everybody got up and was live at that moment. Now say 10 years later, you got a friend with you. He's a good guy, but he wasn't there when me and my boys formed this. So when that song comes on, our DNA tightens, tightens, tightens. There's a particular song, a scale, in the genomes for each and every one of us. Now when that song is played, when your particular prime resonant frequency is played, guess what happens? Your DNA celebrates and tightens. Everything else gets pushed out. Harmonic wave resequencing. The carbon is also the key of E and yellow. The Nitrogen is G, and all these play a song. So say that the F over F sharps of the oxygen, the green, is only hitting at an, an F. Why? Because there's another frequency coming in from a generator over there. That's changing and causing it to change. So this F now hits the oxygen. And when it hits, when, when, when this, this, no, the F hits the carbon, so the, Instead of hitting as an F sharp, it hits as an F, so when it hits the carbon at an E, it doesn't hit it quite right, so the domino don't file right. So the next domino hits wrong. And so now we have a malformation happening within our DNA because the frequencies are being pushed off. But when we hear our tone, we tighten back up. So yeah, I'm in the process of building the harmonic wave resequencer with another doctor who has been able to successfully cure AIDS and cancer, and it's well underway. But I wanted you guys to understand how that works. It's so simple. You do not need to tear the human body apart when all you can do is use frequency to bring it back to its normal space. Great, thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go to you. Thank you so much. I've always been interested in acting, so it's pretty cool to be in the presence of an actor. 
Um, but my question actually has to do with your uh, numbers theory. Um, so if by your logic you say one times one equals two, um, are you insinuating that one times zero then equals one? Equals one. Well, that's what we were saying with the identity principle, the identity property. It says that one times nothing equals nothing. Something, so now you have the laws of physics have to now adjust because something just disappeared. Conservation of energy, energy can't be created or destroyed. So if one times zero equals zero, then what happened to the energy of the one? Isn't that the same problem that Stephen Hawkins were talking about with the event horizon and the information going in and still being present? that conflict that was started? Well, that's because of the math. The math, the principles in the math are not founded on truth. It's not founded on substance. The identity principle, anything times zero is zero, and anything times one is one. Where is that, is that number? Where is that exemplified in nature or in universal phenomena? Is it? Do you see that? So then, are you saying that one times five would be six? Yes. Well, what does it say in the, associate, the, the associative and commutative thing? So you're if proposing... If A and B are positive integers, it says if A and B are positive integers, A is to be added to itself as many times as is indicated by units in B. So you're not proposing an audit. You're proposing like a, a re whole, well, I'm not the first one of the way we, we understand math. You know what's interesting? In 1856, a man from Liverpool named Richard Dover Statter challenged the Dewey Decimal System and said that it was wrong and created an entirely new system to show how it can be brought into correction. So I'm not the first person to say this. It's a number of people did it, but look up Richard Dover Statter. Try and find him. You won't find him because he'd been erased from history almost. But what is the thing called, honey? Dewey Decimal System as a whole, the Dewey Decimal System as a whole, and you will see that this has, we are headed to, the Titanic is headed to an iceberg over there with our numbers. If we don't make a change soon, we're going to crash as a species because our math needs to work in order for our, our science and our future to develop. Sorry, one last question. Um, do you, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Go. Do you think it's our, um, do you think that the reason that we have like economic crises, for example, is because we are not understanding um, our numbers correctly, according to your theory? Well, I think we have an economic problem because we are the only creatures in this universe that use currency. There are no other creatures that use currency in order to exist. Why is it that we chose this strange thing that isn't even real. Other creatures, they drink water, they eat fruit, they eat other animals. We exchange with currency, and our system of exchanging with currency is flawed because of greed. There's not an e like if one times one equals two, we've got an equilibrium of, of balance. One times one equals one, you've got loss. When one times one equals three or more, you're talking about over unity and supersymmetry. And that's how you get the universe to work for you. Instead of you use, using just the solar voltaics off of it, you also use some the polar, the um, piezoelectric effects of it. You use other things to make greater unity. But one times one equaling one, when it could also equal a dollar, pound times a pound equaling a pound, when it could also equal four dollars or ten dollars or a hundred dollars, does that make sense? To you, do you think the banks are abusing that? What's a quarter times a quarter? If I ask you, ask anybody in this room, what's a quarter times a quarter? That's 25 times 25. The, court, the computer will tell, tell, the calculator will tell you 6.25 cents. But we know 25 pence times 25 pence is 625 pence. That's six pounds and 25 pence, but the computer or the banks only have to give you six and a quarter cents reference for it. Or let's say you put a dime times a dime. Go ahead, oh, let me get this out. Say you take a dime times a dime. You put that in your, in your calculator, it says one cent. 0.10 times 0.10 is one cent. 
but we know a dime times a dime is a whole dollar. But the banks gives us money based on that evaluation. Is that fair? And I might get shot about talking about this right now, but I've got a book coming out called Does a Dollar Times a Dollar Equal a Dollar or Does a Dollar Times a Dollar Equal Two Dollars? And in the process, not only do I explain the death of the platonic solids, but I also introduce the new Terrian wave conjugations that replace this Euclidean way of life and gives us a three-dimensional way of seeing the world. That's what I'm saying. Do you want to see the world in 2D or do you want to see it in 3D? Thank you. Because our math right now is 2D. Our math is black and white and stick figures. I want the world in, in, in multicolor spectral vision. That's it, I can go home. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Um, who wants, who speaks up first? Uh, this dude, his energy is there, go. Strong energy too, man, but. Uh, you said that a dollar times a dollar is two dollars? Huh? You said that, say, a pound times a pound is two pounds? A pound times a pound should be two pounds. Yeah. If action but times when action. you multiply those two things together, you get a pound squared. A pound squared, yeah. That the unit gets squared as well. One squared. Say that again. We use the mic <laughs> so I can hear you. Uh, so you're saying one pound times one pound is equal to two pounds, but it's one pound squared, which doesn't make any sense because you've got a one squared pound, unit. One squared. One pound squared. You can't, can you divide pounds? Can you divide money? If you can divide it, you can multiply it. What, a pound times a pound? What, a pound squared, two pounds? I think that's what he's trying to That two pound, one squared? Well, you know, it's funny, I actually patented one squared. All these things that I showed you guys, I've patented all these things. You know why I patented it then? Because in 1926, a man named Walter Russell wrote a book called The Universal One, and in it he introduced an entirely new periodic table. And there he, he introduced the two um, <laughs> heavy water elements, and then plutonium and, and deuterium. Both of those, all four of those elements that had never been discovered, he sent out to 800 different universities in his book. Two years later, he watched as other um, people came and got Nobel Prizes for his work. Why? Because he didn't patent it. He didn't copyright it. So I copyright all these things and patented all these things before bringing them to you. They are true, and um, I think there's some value to them. I don't know why I said that. Did I? I think they're thinking that Yes, yeah, the decimal system that's off. The money is, the, there's nothing wrong with the money, but how we deal with the money. But if you, can, if you can divide money, you can multiply it. It works hand in hand. Okay, or you can't see that. You can't see dividing money. No, it's a matter of definition. If you define, it's a matter of definition. A pound squared is not a unit defined. A pound squared. If you def multiply by mathematical convention, if you multiply one pound by one pound, same as if you multiply one meter by one meter, it should be one pound squared or one square it meter. It becomes two. Why does it become one pound squared is two, isn't it? Now, if you look at the, remember what I just said about the associative and the commutative laws. It says A is to be added to itself as many times as is units in B. And the only thing that prevents that is the identity element that sits up and says, no, the Jim Crow law sits. Black people sit in the back of the bus because that's what the law says, without even having a foundation for it. One times one, one times any number is that number, without a foundation, with no principle, it just says it. But if you go by your logic and you say one times one is two, one times th two, two is, is three. three, and then how would you define two times four? Is that, that, that's two, that stays, all that remains the same. Anything with one, just add one. The first rule of okay, multiplication. Okay, then where's the difference between addition and multiplication? Well, multiplication is what? Exaggerated addition, isn't it? But isn't it a matter of mathematical convention? 
It's what is? If it was defined in the beginning, it could have been defined differently, but logical, it makes the Use most the sense. Mic, darling. Sorry. If you, is there a matter of mathematical convention? If you define beforehand that something, like, it, logically, it makes the most sense that one times one, if you have one laptop, one times a laptop is one laptop, that makes more sense than you say it's two laptops. Well, now, if you say... And then that's where the mathematical convention comes in. And that's, like, most, like, large part of math is convention. It's how it has been defined. It's a matter of definition. And it's wonderful. The convention is all right if the material and the information being shared in the convention is true. But when you're talking about dogma being added in with that thing that I showed you, did you look at the square root of two? Do you think that that's a loop, that that's a natural thing with the square root of two? Did you believe that? Pi, it's like more mathematical. No, 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 it's not the same, though. It's not the same with pi. What we just did, we, 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 we multiplied, we cubed the number, and then we divided it by two, and we cubed it again and divided it by two, and we did that a number of times, and that number still remained the same exact number, which we know cannot happen. It's right there. And that's what they say is the difference between, that's what they say allows one times one to equal one, because one, you know, 1.414213562373095 dot 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 is the square root of two. But we know that that's not the case, because it's illogical, that loop makes it invalid. I'm afraid that is all we have time for. Um, so please join me in thanking Brian Parks.